And although this key is clearly presented throughout the Bible from the Old Testament right through the New, I think the majority of Christians are unaware that it exists. And I think the failure to use this key that I'm going to be speaking about is one main source of ineffectiveness in the body of Christ. No doubt you're wondering what the key is. And let me say that when, I, when you hear it, you're not likely to say, praise the Lord. I want to turn again to the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where Jesus is giving instruction about how to pray. And I want to take two parallel passages. The first one is in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. And Jesus says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. And then he describes how the hypocrites act. And then he says in verse 6, But when you pray, pray in this way. So he uses the phrase, when you pray, twice. The first time, he starts with a negative. Don't pray like the hypocrites. But he doesn't finish there. He ends with a positive, this is how you ought to pray. And we have actually devoted the last session to analyzing the pattern that he gave us. But now I want to move on in that same sixth chapter to verses 16 and 17. And here he introduces another dimension of prayer. And he says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites. But he doesn't stop with the negative. A lot of people think that's where he ends. But he goes on in the next verse, But when you fast, and then he tells us how to do it in a way that's acceptable to God. Now I think you can see there's a close parallel between what Jesus says about praying and what he says about fasting. First of all he says, when you fast, then he says, don't do it this way, do it that way. But to my way of thinking, the phrase, when you fast, indicates that Jesus expects his disciples did I say fast? When you pray, Jesus expects his disciples to pray. How many of you would agree that those words indicate Jesus takes it for granted that we as his disciples will pray? He doesn't say if you pray, but he says when you pray. And I imagine that most of us here tonight would agree that the Lord expects us as Christians to pray regularly. Is that right? Okay, now we go on to the next stage and he doesn't say if you fast, he says when you fast. What does that indicate? It indicates that he expects us to fast in just the same way as he expects us to pray. Is that logical? Are you with me? even maybe reluctantly, but still you're with me. Well, don't be reluctant. I agree that the subject of fasting is not easy to say praise the Lord about, but I want to tell you, when you discover what's in this subject, you will say praise the Lord. You will say thank you God for giving us this key. See, Jesus' words about praying and about fasting are ex exactly parallel. When you pray, don't pray this way, but pray that way. When you fast, don't fast this way, but fast that way. So Jesus puts praying and fasting on exactly the same level. My conclusion is that if he expects us to pray, he also expects us to fast. And I'm so glad that I have one great predecessor in the ministry that arrived at the same conclusion. Actually, there were many of them. Luther arrived at that conclusion. But the one I have in mind is John Wesley. 
And I read John Wesley's journals years ago, and they stirred me and stimulated me. And he said something to this effect. Uh, I am persuaded that if a Christian has understood the need to fast and does not practice fasting, he will backslide just as surely as a Christian who has understand, understood the need to pray and does not pray. And John Wesley would not ordain to the Methodist ministry any man who did not commit himself to fast every Wednesday and Friday till 4 p.m. That was a basic requirement for being ordained to the Methodist ministry. You might say, well, what's the purpose of fasting? Is it just to make life hard for me? To deny me pleasure? My answer would be no. Doubtless there are a number of purposes, but I'm going to deal with only one. And that is, it is a God-appointed way to humble ourselves. And I will show you this very, very clearly out of scripture. See, the greatest single specific barrier to getting an answer to our prayers is pride. And anything that will get that barrier out of the way will facilitate the answer to our prayers. God has been speaking to me personally just lately about the awful dangers of pride. And Ruth picked up a little book, well, she, she owned it, but we'd really not paid much attention to it, by Andrew Murray, who is one of those preachers of a previous generation who's still feeding the people of God today. How many of you have read at least one book by Andrew Murray? That's most of the people here, that's remarkable. I don't know whether you know this little book, it's entitled in the original, The Humility of Our Lord. It's been republished with a simpler title, I think simply humility. And I read this just a few weeks ago and it really spoke to me personally about my own life. I've hated pride for years but I got a new vision of how vicious and how evil pride is and how it keeps us back from all the blessings that God intends for us. This message runs through the Bible. It's a universal truth. It was not demonstrated first on earth. You know the first demonstration of the evil of pride? What was the first sin in the history of the universe? Tell me. Pride, yes. Who committed the sin? Lucifer, that's right. An angel in heaven. And if that pride, if pride as a sin could break out in heaven and cause an angel to lose his place, how much more susceptible are we likely to be to, pr as pri to pride as sinners here on earth? Let me give you just <coughs> three passages of scripture that deal with pride and with humility. The first is in Luke 14 and verse 11. And it's the end of a parable where Jesus speaks about how to act when you're invited to a banquet in Luke 14. And I mean, we get to invited to banquets nowadays sometimes. In fact, I was at one yesterday. And Jesus said, oh, he's so practical. He gives such simple illustrations. First of all, I want to point out to you that God never says he'll humble us. He always tells us to humble ourselves. I tell people, God can humiliate you, but only you can make yourself humble. Don't pray, God, make me humble because it's not a scriptural prayer and furthermore you probably regret, regret the results of that prayer. <laughs> a few weeks or months later when you find yourself in the most humiliating situation you think, God how did I get here? God said, you prayed. <laughs> you prayed. So Jesus says when you're invited to a banquet don't walk up to the head table and sit at the chief place. Because you'll be embarrassed when somebody comes along and says, but the speaker's going to sit here. You take a place over there in the corner. So Jesus says, when you go, take the lowest place. 
very wise. When you're at the bottom, there's only one way you can go. That's up. I don't know whether you know that prayer by jo uh, jo um, Bunyan. What's his name? John Bunyan. Uh, this has been with me for years. He that is down need fear no fall. He that is low, no pride. He that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. See, when you're on the floor, you're safe. There's no lower you can go. Very rarely do I uh, minister in a large public gathering like this without first taking my place on the floor, on my face, before God. And I can tell you, before these meetings, Ruth and I were there for quite a long while. That's where I feel really safe, is on the floor. So Jesus said at the end of that parable, if you don't want to be embarrassed, avoid the situation. Don't sit at the top table. Sit in the lowest place, and there's only one way you can be asked to go, and that is up. And then he sums it up with these, these words in Luke 14, 11. For whoever exalts himself will be abased, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's universal. In other words, it applies throughout the universe. It applies in heaven, it applies on earth. The great demonstration of this truth is Lucifer and Jesus. Lucifer was a created being, but he reached for equality with God. He slipped and fell. Jesus had equality with God. He humbled himself even to the death of the cross. And the scripture says, God highly exalted him. It says in Philippians 2.9, therefore God highly exalted him. Why did God exalt him? Because he humbled himself. That's right. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. I can promise you exaltation if you'll humble yourself. There are no exceptions. I have a series of messages which has this title, The Way Up is down. The lower down you go, the higher up you'll end. There's no exceptions to that. But I want to speak about humility as an essential condition for effective prayer. And I want to take a number of statements to this effect. Let's look first of all, before we do that, in James chapter 4 verse Okay, uh, yeah, we'll stop there. And, uh, and then he goes on, you know, the introduction itself is like 15 minutes long. So, um, uh, you know, so uh, looking at his life and ministry and the teaching, uh, a wonderful teacher of the word, it takes his time though, <laughs> and uh, really tests the patience of the hearers. Uh, but it's it's really line by line, line upon line, uh, and uh, really inspiring. At the same time, you know, uh, uh, one gets um, exposed to the the truth in a very systematic manner, and on you know uh, on certain topics as well. So, yeah. Um, so, your thoughts. I just want to hear from you. Um, what do you think? What is it that really touched you? What is it that you um, um, that was highlighted uh, through these? Um, to these videos about Derek Prince. And I think maybe some of you would have you know, listened to many of his messages and so on. So just want to hear from, uh, from you. Yeah, go ahead, Charles. Um. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, me, um, I was moved by the, the way God you got him. The way he got him uh, in his in his unknowing, he could he didn't know the Pentecostal, he didn't know the Baptists, but God drew him. Mm. That is that one pierced me more, 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 more. He drew him until he he, he now he is saying a miracle happened. Someone raised up my hand, eh? <laughs> and I was like, ah, God. So it's so it it touched my heart in a way that. God is the one who draws us. He looks for us. He takes us to places that we did not expect him to, 
to 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 take us and then he uses us for his ministry thank you right charles thank you yeah anyone else Um, anyone else, you can just um, share your thoughts. Okay, I want to say, um, for me, I got, you know, he got me when he said, um, you better be careful when you, when you pray about humbleness. You know, when you pray that God should, you know, make you humble mm -hmm. because I know that I have prayed that kind of prayer mm -hmm. and there are some situations you know that come before me and I'm like you know asking myself you know questions mm -hmm. or even finding myself you know asking God questions so when he made that statement I laughed mm -hmm. because in those moments you know you want to deal with a lot and that is where the test you know, comes. And it's very important for us as Christians or ministers or pastors to know what it means you know, to be humble. Not just mm -hmm. humble before God, but humble before every situation that comes our way. So that's right. my take for this. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Harrison. Yeah, so Rose uh, shares here. Yeah, you could see that Derek Prince really wants to connect with the listeners, humor, practical experiences, humility, yeah, and wanting to lift others to the knowledge of the ways of the Lord. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, I think the knowledge of Greek and uh, Latin, which he studied, has, you know, helped him really give... Uh, as the very good interpretation of the word. The way he mm. interprets is very sound because uh, he says that he has a very good hold on these languages and understanding this uh, gives a, gives him this edge and the way he speaks. I've been listening to him uh, exactly like what you shared, Pastor. Mm -hmm. I was born again. Accidentally, I came across and I bought uh, two or three of his books that time uh, we didn't okay. have the technology to hear uh, the word on YouTube or something. Mm -hmm. But those books, I just scanned through and I read through. And uh, his book, uh, books had really helped me understand things so beautifully. And right. Since then, uh, after YouTube came and we started hearing him and learning mm -hmm. things, I still have a book on my table, Power of Proclamation, every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Always on my study. That. And I love to read and go mm -hmm. through situations whenever you know he has some very good uh, way of under helping us understand the power of right. yeah. thank right. you so much pastor for yeah. sharing such beautiful word yeah, thank right. you thank you yeah so um like only said um you know um of course the uh, knowledge or the understanding of the of the hebrew and the greek um definitely helps uh, helps us to you know go back to the root um and look at uh, you know what the language is actually saying and it gives so much uh, richness to the same as uh, the same verse you know like uh, um, I, I remember mentioning it before like psalm 23 surely goodness and mercy will follow you uh, the rest of your you know all the days of your life and and that word uh, used there in hebrew actually uh, talks about um, a lion coming after its prey you know uh, so we it's not a you know reluctantly following or uh, uh, you know uh, that kind of a grace and surely goodness and mercy following you you know from a distance but it's like a hungry lion which is going after its prey right so that's the picture that we have in the hebrew so uh, definitely knowing that now when you, when you read that verse when you every time you encounter that verse or you declare that verse you know that a grace and you know goodness and mercy will follow me it's like hunting me down you know and um, so yeah that definitely helps uh, but also another thing that i noticed like uh, you know uh, a man of prayer of course a man of uh, the, um, reading the word uh, and also uh, because uh, you know um, he is uh, uh, intimate with the Lord, right? He was also listening 
to the word of God, uh, listening to God's uh, spirit speaking to him. So, you know, he talks about that in, in incident when uh, he prayed that prayer for leaders and then, you know, Montgomery uh, saying, um, you know, and making that reference, we will look to the Lord and uh, and the Holy Spirit speaking to him and saying, you know, hey, this is the answer to the prayer that you prayed. And so, um, you know, uh, and and th that, that is that in itself is a revelation, right? In that interaction with the Holy Spirit and, and God revealing and connecting the dots and saying, you know, this is this is an answer. And so, you know, both both this, you know, uh, both the academic and, uh, you know, the, the rigor of um, uh, researching and uh, being sensitive uh, to the leading of the Holy Spirit and uh, when he speaks and makes that connection and both put together, uh, you know, a, a powerful teaching ministry, right? Okay, uh, anyone else uh, wants to share any thoughts? Um, follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Uh, kept renewing his mind on the word. Yes, thank you, Kennedy. Um, anyone else? Uh, so I'm just amazed, you know, uh, when I when uh, when we look at the different um, the fivefold ministry, the way uh, each uh, ministry functions or the ministry gift functions, um, you know, people of different temperament, uh, and uh, uh, so I, I'm just wondering, you know. Jesus are example, so how wonderful it will be to encounter Jesus, right? He is the, the perfect teacher, the perfect evangelist, the, the perfect pastor, um, the perfect man, right? To And, and uh, when we see him face to face, it must be, uh, it must be really truly wonderful, right? Uh, when we have an encounter with him, when we, uh, and we'll never want to leave his side you know, leave his presence. Um, and we can do that today, right? We can uh, we can continue to be in the presence of God because he has made a way for us to come to him and uh, we can be in his presence. So uh, the more we encounter the presence of God, the presence of Jesus, you know, is so beautiful, so wonderful. If a human being can be, uh, you know, um, if 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 you when we look at someone who's intellectual, if you look at someone who's, uh, you know, who's accomplished much, or uh, you know, uh, who has these special abilities, and how much more Jesus, right? And we are created in his in his image, and um, because that image is broken by sin, you know, we see those glimpses, uh, though that image is marred, and but you know, brought back to restoration and redemption uh, because of the cross of Christ, right? So, um, yeah, I was just thinking about that. Uh, it must be truly, truly amazing to sit at the feet of Jesus, to hear him speak and to hear him teach and uh, just to be in his presence, right? Uh, yeah, I was just thinking about that. Okay, um, let's look at uh, the life of a pastor so I was thinking, you know, which pastor, and I just thought maybe the pastor who made a big difference in my my life. There have been many pastors who uh, made, you know, uh, many um, uh, wonderful uh, who who led me and nurtured me and uh, made, uh, you know, uh, contributed so much in my life. Uh, but I just thought, um, you know, the one who has done it consistently, and that's, uh, you know, Pastor Ashish, of course. And I think all of us know him and to some extent. So I just thought, OK, uh, maybe I'll make it a quiz. I'll make it a trivia uh, and I'll ask you, OK, uh, some questions. So maybe you can answer uh, the first part of it. <laughs> OK, so first. Uh, it, uh, again, a disclaimer: This is in no way to uh, exalt the man, right? Uh, this is no way to put him on a pedestal, um, uh, but uh, just to look at the pastoral ministry, uh, to look at uh, what happens when a person is uh, is obedient to the call. Uh, so that's that's the thing. So I, I I hope you you know you know you um, uh, you get my heart behind this so it's 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 not to uh, it's just that right okay so what is um pastor ashish's full name anyone so no googling okay <laughs> no going to the website no googling so uh, if you know it you put it here okay anyone you can put it on the chat or you can let me know 
Tarun. Okay. Fast Ashish Rachur. Ashish Rachur. Um, it's not his full name, actually. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Let me put it. Okay. His name is Ashish Srikant. Um, right, sure. No, I don't know the history behind the <laughs> Srikant bit, but that's his full name. Um, okay. I happen to see, I think, his. Uh, I don't know, some ID card of his, which had the full name. So I know that his name is Ashish Srikant Raichur. Um, OK, so uh, Pastor Ashish uh, came to know the Lord. OK, when, uh, how old was he when he came to know the Lord? OK, 12, full points. Anita, 12 years old. I think he was uh, just uh, entering his, it, it was just his, uh, you know, Teen years, just about to enter into his uh, uh, teen years, I think. So, th I think 12 is the correct answer. Right? So, he's 12 years old, uh, came to know the Lord, and um, and uh, he was uh, a student as uh, in Bishop Cotton Boys High School here in Bangalore. Came to know the Lord. Um, uh, immediately, there was a great hunger in his in him to um, to know more about him. So, he would spend uh, a lot of time reading the word uh, understanding the word and also they uh, came to know the lord in a very um, you know uh, in a very uh, very very simple manner but uh, god ordained manner uh, uh, there was a teacher in his uh, school who uh, who would conduct the chapel every afternoon post lunch they would go and uh, they would you know sing a few songs uh, hear a, a scripture being read and that was it so um, so that particular afternoon this teacher i think he, he taught uh, english and science right um, so he would he asked that question you know uh, do you have you received jesus into your heart so to all the students and and uh, and then led them to the lord and uh, um, one of the persons who responded to the altar call was uh, Pastor Ashish, and he testified saying, "Okay, something different happened, and put, there was a great hunger to know more about uh, the Lord." Um, now, about about his family, they were church going. Like right? they used to go to the Methodist church, uh, which was nearby. Uh, they were church going, but um, for him, you know, he hadn't uh, received Jesus, and he did so at school. And God put him put in him a, a great desire to um, to learn. And also, also to preach, you know, to share the word, and uh, and uh, it came out in very uh, very interesting ways. Like um, he started to um, share the gospel uh, at the chapel uh, with with the students, and also he would go to another school, which was the Baldwin Boys School, which uh, was about I think a twenty minute walk. Or a fifteen-minute walk from 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 his school, so he started going there in the afternoons and started uh, conducting. You know, this is twelve years where you know normally a boy of that age would be uh, playing sport and not thinking anything about preaching or teaching. But then um, there was so much of hunger, desire to go preach. So um, so he would go there, and I think some of his friends were there. So I forget the details, but he would share the share the gospel, teach from the word, whatever the Lord was teaching him, he would teach. So he was doing this for uh, during his lunch break and uh, some interesting um, things happened there i think somebody was uh, somebody had a problem with a knee with a with a with a some pain in the knee and then uh, he, since he read in the word that jesus did that and we could also do that so he laid hands and prayed and and uh, the person got healed uh, no pain and testified to that and so those were the early years where god was you know leading him to do it um, so he also um, apparently went uh, to the uh, to the pastor in the Methodist Church. Um, by this time, he was uh, uh, he 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 would go there to the Methodist Church every Saturday and spend the whole day in prayer. Like there was a hall which was there, uh, which was uh, people. Uh, 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 didn't use it, and people were not there, so he had the time. So he would go in and uh, lock himself up and just, uh, you know, pray, pray in the spirit, and uh, and then spend the whole day in prayer, uh, reading the word, etc. Um, so he do that. So um, so one day he went to the pastor of the church and said, uh, you know, I want to preach in church. So um, 
so the pastor uh, i don't know what went through his you know he's this young man and he wants to come and young boy and wants to preach so um so the pastor said um you know i i'll think about it and then again he said uh, i'll let you preach in the uh, evening service um but uh, it is not during the service but after the service or something you know like that so so uh, uh so he, he he did that and uh, then he got to preach there and he gave an altar call uh, so this was after the service um you know uh, after the service was done then he, he could share the word uh, surprisingly there were a lot of students who would come uh, uh, i think this was at uh, um yeah there was a the, uh, i think a lot of students from the hostel of baldwin boys would come to that particular church in the evening so um came there and uh, he shared the gospel with them gave an altar call and uh, and many people many of the students received jesus so those were the early days of ministry where you know the lord encouraged uh, you know he was encouraged by what he saw and what and there was a call uh early on in his life for bigger things to uh to plant a church and so on so he he did his um uh, uh you know his schooling and um uh one interesting event in his life is after he finished schooling he he said uh, he is thinking like uh, you know why should i study further you know i just want to go into ministry anyway jesus is coming soon the world is going to end so it's better that i go about uh, preaching the gospel and doing ministry so um so when about um, he, he, he he told his parents that you know i don't want to study any, study any further so uh so the parents didn't know what to do so the father took him his father took him and to meet uh, uh, another pastor uh, uh, who was a, quite a senior experienced person in ministry so he took him to meet him to um, to probably you know, talk some sense into him and and so this pastor asked you know uh, okay what do you want to do and then said you know i want to do this so so he said you know uh, the lord jesus uh, spent um, time preparing you know there was uh, before he started his earthly ministry there was this season there was he, he, he was he was uh, uh, by the time he started it, uh, his ministry it was probably around 29 or 30 so why don't you also wait why don't you prepare yourself you know if jesus could do it you know why can't you so then he he thought about it and he said he was convinced okay <laughs> i'll wait so uh, so that's how he went on to do his studies he went on to uh, do his engineering in uh, in a place called manipal which is uh, you know coastal uh, karnataka the state in which bangalore is uh, it's, it's on the coast um uh, so he went on to this is the west coast of india so went on to study there did his engineering there and while he was um, you know uh, you see the pattern right um, while he was doing his engineering there he started again uh, you know a fellowship he had a desire to start a students fellowship so uh, started a students bible study and fellowship and uh, and so uh, invited students and this is like uh, you know very very early days so uh, invited students and uh, took a step of faith and hired uh, a hall in the hotel right there was a hotel there so a lot of international uh, students uh, would come to manipal either to do their engineering management studies uh, medical uh, you know uh, studies and so on so medicine and so on so it's really a education hub manipal mangalore you know these uh, these town these cities so um, so yeah so he he wanted to um, start a bible study so took a step of faith hired a hall i uh, wasn't sure how many will show up but did it anyway and students started coming right he felt that uh, you know we wanted to have a like a, a spirit filled uh, uh, church and and teaching so he would teach um, i think this was in the evenings um, so they would come uh and uh, the uh, at one point it was uh, it was almost like 100 plus students coming and by the time he had um, finished his four years of engineering studies uh, it had grown to be um i think it was uh, you know it was uh, supported by the students themselves of the offerings and everything and they used to meet there and he handed off the work to another student and uh, and that uh, work continued and 
became a fully fledged church uh, with a pastor um, and so on. So, um, uh, and then it went into some rough weather, uh, you know, uh, uh, ministry kind of uh, 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 changed, there were some transitions and so on, but the church still continues, right? So, uh, so that was that was that, and then we went on to the U.S. to do his um, uh, engineering uh, postgraduate studies and uh, spent some time there. Again, started an international students fellowship where he was, uh, where he was uh, studying. Um, I think Rutgers University did biomedical engineering there, and uh, there also, you know, uh, I, I remember the first um, first. Uh, the students fellowship that he started there the first one for again for international students and he went and you know uh, invited uh, a lot of students you know hey, i think the students fellowship why don't you come uh, on campus invited got permission from the invited everyone and uh, he says you know on the day of the meeting the first uh, meeting uh, the attendance was zero right no one showed up absolutely no one showed up uh but then you know there he was so the time came so he started a you know uh, he had a tape recorder so he put the cassette uh, and then he he uh, pressed record and preached you know and he says uh, he preached as if the the hall was full Oh, there were thousands of students so he went on to preach the full message i i forget uh, the length of the sermon but uh, and also the title i don't know but then he uh, you know preached the full length of the sermon as if the place was full of people filled with people just preached it uh, stopped the machine and and that was day one so uh, the next day i think people asked hey um so so how was the study sorry i couldn't come so how was it um you know how did it go so i said yeah uh, you know you, you want to listen to the message here's the message so so they you know the, he made copies of the tape and gave it to people and uh, uh, and then they got to hear the message and there also you know like the work grew um so so whatever season of life you know as a student as a as a, as a school student as a as a um, uh, you know, as someone in campus, uh, you know, as a college, postgraduate. So there was always the thing to to start a work where there was no work. You know, very apostolic call, right? Uh, a pioneering work. At the same time, a pastoral call to, to gather the people, to nurture, uh, and you see the teaching also. You know, to teach them the word and get them grounded in the word and so on. So um, then there was this uh, strong call uh, of God uh, in his heart to. Uh, come back to India. You know, he, he knew that he will always come back to India and start uh, a church uh, and, and start a work in Bangalore, India, and also, you know, uh, do uh, work uh, from India, based in India, uh, in in the nation, and also something that will touch uh, the nations worldwide. So there was always the always the stirring, always the call, and so he always knew that he was not going to be there, uh, even though you know a lot of people are moving to the U.S. and uh, you know studying there, working there, settling down. Uh, he knew that he will always come back. Right. So he. Um, so he started off with biomedical engineering and then he shifted on to um, i think software worked there for i forget how many years but um, he used to serve in an afro american church uh, and also uh, in a, in a latin uh, latino church uh, i don't know if that's the acceptable term but um, you know basically spanish speaking congregation with the translation right so so there were these two uh, churches that he was serving and uh, and also uh, you know like preaching and teaching there uh, uh, initially you know just being there uh, just being of help and then uh, the leadership just invited him to preach and teach and he would do that uh, and from there uh, you know went on to do some missions work in, in Europe as well you know uh, Albania and uh, uh, and uh, some of the nations which were actually communist in nature uh, in government uh, during that time eastern europe so uh, missions uh, you know work and also come down to india to do some missions work right so um, that's um, uh, uh, so that was happening and then finally in 2000 the year 2000 uh, oh by this time uh, he had also uh, married I got married to amy uh, and amy was uh, uh, that uh, he came to know Amy through um, through the fellowship, 
which was happening, the same fellowship which he had started, uh, Amy was part of that this, uh, in in Manipal, but he hadn't met her when he was in India. And uh, he, he came to know of her through, uh, he used to send these, uh, I think, letters of teaching, you know. Uh, uh, so whatever he used to learn, he used to send letters to the students whom he knew and, uh, you know, as... And uh, of course, I, I I don't know too many of the too many of the details of that, but um, you know uh, that's how they corresponded, and then they uh, you know later on uh, got married, um, and she moved to the U.S. and uh, uh, and they had two children there in the U.S., a son and a daughter, and but the plan was always to come back, of course, and so they moved back to India in 2000 and started the work. The work started with 12 people. Uh, it was in the year uh, 2001, um, February 18, 12 in the living room of his father, and uh, that's, that's how it started. And the and the, and one of the songs which they sang was uh, "We Have a Vision," you know, which was sung at the you know, 20th anniversary of the church um, Thanksgiving service. Also, um, so that was one of the songs. We have a vision for this nation. We have a vision for this land. And uh, and uh, and I remember going through. Uh, one of the old uh, uh, notebooks which was there which was used for you know writing uh, what was the uh, you know what was the attendance how many people were there and then what was the you know uh, what was the spending you know what did we spend on tea coffee whatever and then um, uh, what is the uh, uh, you know offer tree and in one of the notebooks it was very clearly written in the first meeting itself you know this is our vision uh, this is, uh, we want to be a voice to the nation and to the nations. And these are the ministries that we are planning. <laughs> and if you look at the list, you know, there's like TV, radio, there's hospital, there's, uh, you know, this is the very, very first meeting. So I wonder what uh, the 12 people, you know, what was going on in the, you know, the minds of the 12 who were listening, you know, here we are, 12 people, and here is this, you know, here is this big vision, and here are these things shared. And um, But that's how it's, you know that's how it started, and um, you know I had the privilege of visiting uh, uh, ABC uh, right then in 2001 itself. 2001, towards the end of 2001, I think it was in September, and uh, it was a very very small place. You know, less than 20, less than 15, I think people meeting. Um, so uh, went for uh, you know I was part of the Methodist Church, uh, uh, part of the worship team there, and then we went there to uh, to lead worship, and uh, uh, so that's how a common friend had called, and then we went we saw uh, it's the first time meeting Pastor Ashish, meeting Amy in uh, 2001, and um, and seeing you know uh, oh this is a very different place. They were meeting at a you know uh, there was a go karting place and it had an outhouse you know all thatched roof um so that's where the church was meeting at that time it had moved from the living room of the father's house to this place and from then on we used to go there you know uh, every uh, ever, ever so often you know maybe probably once a month and every time we would hear oh apc is meeting here apc is meeting here because they had grown and uh, and and then so we you know um we saw the kind of uh, uh, god's faithfulness in uh, and also people being drawn to the vision of the uh, of the ministry and the church and and so on so um, church growing uh, we saw that um and uh, i think this was uh, in 90 um I forget the year now uh, 2000 sorry 2003 or uh, 2004 is when we we invited you know we me and my wife uh, my wife and i we were actually youth um, advisors in the church where we were uh, meeting so we invited him to be the the speaker the guest speaker as a uh, for the youth uh, camp right so pastor ashish and the team came from apc they shared and and our uh, uh, you know our desire was that the people be filled with the spirit be baptized in the spirit and so on because we had experienced ourselves and we wanted the same thing for uh, young people so the team came and pastor preached uh, you know all those i think two and a half days and um, you know uh, many of them were baptized in the spirit and filled with the spirit and prayed in tongues and so on um so uh, that is uh, that that, so after that, we you know we started visiting the church and um, uh, and eventually I, start, I started volunteering at the church. We 
uh, we moved from this church. We gave up our position here. We explained to the leadership, moved to this church, uh, moved to, I mean, uh, started attending APC, uh, one of the locations. By then, church had two locations, right? Um, so we saw that um, uh, we used to go to another lo uh, location in the south of Bangalore, go there uh, and uh, just help, just attend initially and then serve as a volunteer. So uh, as a volunteer, I used to handle sound, lead worship, uh, and do that kind of thing, those kind of things, um, arrange the chairs and all those. And um, and then uh, there was a position to, uh, I'm just sharing a little bit of my story as well. Uh, there was a position to serve as an administrator, as staff, full-time. And the church had grown. The reason I'm sharing is that the church had grown from 12 to having two locations and uh, and wanting a person to handle the administrative, uh, you know, uh, functioning. So, and the church had plans to start a Bible college. Okay, so I, um, I, I, you know, I was there at that time, right? So, so then I thought, okay, why not apply? Okay. But before that, I remember having a conversation with pastor saying, I, you know, people say that I have a call to be a pastor and I know that I have a call for ministry, but I don't know what to do about, do about it. Uh, what do you think I should do? So I remember pastor saying, you know, why don't you just, you know, read some books on pastoring and uh, what it did, what it means to be a pastor and, and so on. So, you know, get yourself uh, up, uh, you know, um, uh, be knowledgeable about what it is, what the role and responsibility is, get equipped. Um, yeah, so uh, I remember having that conversation. And anyway, this was uh, not pastoral, but then it was more to do with, um, with the administrative side. So that's how I came to be in the ministry. So 2004 uh, to, is uh, when I, uh, you know, when all this happened, 2005 is when I joined the um, you know, as staff full time. So by then, uh, church, uh, we were sharing space, the church office was sharing space with the company. Pastor was also having uh, the software business, and that was also growing. Uh, and so we shared the space and the phone lines uh, of the company, right? So, so there were about four full-time staff. Myself, there was a children's pastor, there was a life group pastor, and there was an administrator. So four of us, uh, and of course, Pastor Ashish was there. So, um, so that's how uh, you know I remember becoming a staff um, uh, of uh, ABC. Yeah. I'll uh, I'll come to that, Abraham. Uh, just I'll, I'll in two minutes. I just want to share uh, about you know uh, one one simple uh, one one main truth that I saw and learned was that uh, um, a few things actually you know four or five things I want to quickly share that okay. one is that um, uh, don't despise the day of small beginnings. Okay, maybe you have a pastoral call. Uh, don't despise the day of small beginnings. Maybe the the it's so small that the church attendance is zero. You know, uh, that's something that I learned from the life uh, of uh, this pastor and the journey. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. There will be days when you know maybe uh, you have inaugural service and everybody comes, friends, family, you know, visitors. But then. Uh, Maybe the next Sunday, you know, it might, it might be zero attendance. It could be one person. Uh, don't despise the day of small beginnings. You know. Uh, um, okay, uh, it's time to stop here. Um, maybe we need to continue later. <laughs> okay, with the pastoral ministry, uh, we will continue with the uh, you know the journey that APC has made, and uh, there are several things, uh, very important things that we can learn uh, about pastor about the pastoral ministry um so uh, we will look at it in the next class so abram very quickly um how did i explain to my formal for the former church about before leaving yeah we we we, we decided to uh, just explain to them and tell them that we were attending this church and that we wanted to move to this church um this particular church and uh, and and that was it you know very very clearly we we explained to them you know we wanted to grow spiritually uh, we uh, because by then we had actually we were attending this church the church that we were part of and we were also visiting other churches we were you know really hungry for more of the word more of the work of the spirit and so um so we explained to the leadership we explained to the pastors uh, of course they took their time and a lot of people were not very happy about it but eventually we left with their blessing it they prayed over us and released us so uh, i'm glad we did that 
what work did I do as an administrator and as a staff? Okay, uh, a lot of things. I, um, I I handled accounts. I did the administration. I was also handling the administration of the Bible College. Uh, we had no clue. I had no clue how to do it. But then, you know, every day was a learning thing. So starting the Bible College, what goes into it? You know, um, I was handling accounts. I was making payments. I was looking at uh, all the vendors, bookings, um, booking of venues. If we had an event, registration of that, uh, arranging for the caterer, the food. Um, so yeah, so basically all these things. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we'll stop here. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a quite a exciting, interesting topic. Um, so we will uh, we will continue uh, in the next class. Okay. Right. Okay. Bye bye. Take care. We'll start. God bless. Uh, thank you, Pastor. God bless you, Pastor. Bye bye. Okay. okay.